Yeah, the icebergs, Frederick Edwin Church, there's the war between the states. What aches is the lie. And then it ends with what aches is the lie again. Well, again, going back to the same thing. Yeah, and this is a famous painting by Frederick Edwin Church of giant icebergs. What we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. Heisenberg, the uncertainty principle uh, there. So there you have, again, icebergs, uh, hard, uh, rigid, uh, large, but moving slowly as the war between the states. So um, then you have northwest, east and, east and south, presumably the NW. All those letters, though. So you yeah. you would, are you are able to read into different things with that. Yeah. I think that's an excellent choice rather than simply saying northwest, east, south. You have them just as letters. Yeah. Uh, symbol of a loss in white wing. Uh, and, and again, a lot of these, you, uh, you just get to a point where you, you have to, you have to do different kind of things. And it, it's also the date is important, 1861, because this is at the beginning of the war. So uh, it's uncertain what's going to turn out. If this had been dated 1865, it wouldn't. So what aches is the lie. So we're talking about our symbol of indifference, lost in white wing above us. So I, I, I'm, I'm basically using nature. And uh, I believe the painting shows, that I believe, a boat uh, amongst the icebergs, too. Uh, so that there's these looming things that are hanging over a civilization or mankind on this small little boat. I believe I'm, I believe that's right. Let me just Google the icebergs image. I'm sure that's up. Uh, let, let me ask you about the dates and allusions and everything in your work. Do you think that detracts from the quality of the work by using allusions that one may have to look up? Or do you think, it, I, it does enhance it once you've actually looked it up, but do you think that poems should be completely standing on their own? And if not, then do you still see it as a detractor against the art of the poem? No, because as I said, I, I look at the titles and I look at epigraphs and I look at the allusions as uh, the raisins and raisin bread. If you take out the raisins, you'll still have raisin bread. It, 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 I, I, I enjoy doing, and I also think it's good to do, art that can work at multiple levels. If you look at, if you just read something at a straight narrative level and get something from it, great. If you can read it at an elusive level, great. If you can read it at a metaphoric level, and then a political level, and then a philosophical level. Uh, so that's why yeah, I... Your poems are, uh, many of them are exegetic. Yeah. So you'll have to bring into other things. But most of the poems can still stand on their own. I mean, there, there's a few here that that are merely great exercises as opposed to full universes unto themselves. But you can't look at this poem and, and say, and even if you weren't willing to go and look up the dates and the illusions in here, that this doesn't have great lines and great music and isn't technically a great, great poem. Well, it's one of those things, too. The, you, I want to do some poems that are self-contained. I want to do some poems that are dependent to a certain degree on other works and whatnot. Why would I want to just do all poems or all kinds of ways? I want to do all things in all words, which is why I call my show Omniverse again. I prefer the term Omniverse to Multiverse when it comes to physics because a multiverse, is, uh, the presumption is it's multiple multiples of this universe. For me, Omni is better than multi, because multi just says many of things. Omni says many These things in many ways. They'll eventually be going into megaverses next, in the next layer of it, and then maybe you'll just find a, a child with who's made the universe's play thing. But that, that's an issue. We started off with the idea of, of the Big Bang and, and, and God, and God is universe. And in the idea of originality, do you think that uh, in a hundred years most of these ideas will have lapsed, or do you still see the ignorance going on? I think, I, I hope, I think that today's myopia and uh, dark ages of art will go. I think you know it's cyclical. If you went back a hundred or so years ago, uh, a little over a hundred years ago, from say between eighteen seventy and nineteen. 10, 1915, you know, you had, I mean, art was in, in shit state. I mean, yeah, you had the, some painters were coming along, the Ashcan School and whatnot, but writing was, was stagnant. I mean, the novels that were being published were ridiculously bad. Uh, the poetry between Whitman's and, and say, Pound, Eliot, and that ilk uh, was, was really bad. So it, it does cycle. 
one, one of the things you have to recognize too is from about 1910 or so, the 19 teens, to about 1970 or 1980, uh, arguably, uh, you had about six decades of American poetry. Let's just stick with poetry for a second. And that's 60, that's 60 years, just in America alone, forget the rest of the world, there is no other flowering of poetry like that elsewhere in human history. So you had the greatest explosion of, of poetry, great poetry in one nation at one time, and it lasted for six decades. If you look at most of, the, for example, the Chinese poets, you'll have some individual great Chinese poets, but there was never any, they, they weren't, I don't think they lived at the same time. Uh, same thing with like the great- uh, Yeah, some of them are centuries apart. And yeah, they, same thing with the Greeks. The it's, 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 it's a, you know, you <laughs> can- absurd. Yeah, you can lump them together. But if you look at that 60 or so years from 1910 to the, 19, the mid-teens the mid to the mid-70s, say, um, it's unprecedented. So that naturally, there's going to be a fallow period. Uh, uh, you have this political stuff. But at, I, I hope that uh, individuals will get sick and tired of it and say, you know, I want more. I, just, I, I don't need this bullshit. Um, you know, get, let, let, you know, you can't just eat candy all day long. And that's all that we have in culture right now is fucking candy. You know, you're just going to get fat. You're going to get diabetes. You're going to have rotten teeth. You need something for the mind. You need something for the body. Um, and It's interesting to note with all the golden ageism that each era of whatever flowering you have gets better than the last. Yeah. So you, with Whitman, he brought in a, a change in poetry. And then those who were influenced from him were better than any golden age before, if, if you could even name one. I always, I, I find that whatever happens in the 21st century, maybe there's a hundred year stagnance for all I know, that uh, that begins in the next century after this one, will be vastly superior to whatever went on at the beginning of the 20th century to its midpoint. Yeah, well, hopefully there will be people like me or Jessica or Hopefully, if you flower as a, a great writer or Alex Sheremet or, or a handful of other people, uh, they will be able to notice that. Uh, you know, I mentioned Bruce Ariel. He's a good example. Uh, Bruce is someone who's capable of writing a great poem, but he has no clue what he's doing. Um, he, yeah. he really doesn't have yeah, a clue. Bruce is a, a nice guy and at his best a great poet. But, and we'll talk about the E-list. When he sends poems over there, it seems like he's... He, doesn't understand what makes a good poem. He looks to you or to others to explain whether whether uh, it's good or not. And it's partly a lack of confidence and partly just his hit and miss nature. Well, Bruce also has uh, issues with addiction and, and mental uh, disease, uh, mental problems. But uh, um, I, I do I, I do have uh, Bruce. Bruce I think has told his family that if he were to die. That I, I would be his literary executive because I, I I've got a feeling that he's probably got a thousand twelve hundred of these areas and other stuff that I would have to thresh through. Um, I could probably put together two or three uh, books of, of good to very good to you know a couple of dozen two three dozen of his great areas uh, and by by judicious editing he would look a lot better than he would if you look at the you know I think I. Uh, his thousand or so. I think I told you the last time I, I mentioned um, Mark Van Doren, the poet, who was one of the rare selections when he had a small selection of books. He doesn't show up that well, but his co full corpus gives a much greater range of his range as a, a poet. Most often, it's, it's the way it w is with Bruce: is that you can you can you can shape someone's legacy by good editing. Uh, with someone like me, obviously, you can't because. Part of the thing is I'm so sprawling. I, I do things in so many different ways. I mean, just in the poems, the couple of dozen poems, maybe 15, 20 poems we've discussed uh, thus far in, in this session, you know, uh, again, that's a greater range than, you know, probably any four or five great poets you could mention have, have in their The whole other thing page. I'll mention, it's not to kiss your ass, it's simply to mention what is reality. Um, you, your later poems get better than your earlier ones. You lose the near cliches and you state things more directly. Yeah, that's hopefully that's more, more duality and more dimension to them. Sorry, that hopefully that happens in all art. I mean, my my prose now but, that I'm but doing. The thing I want to mention about that is that the worst thing you can say about you is that some of your shorter poems are actually worse than some of your longer ones. Now that's a very rare thing where you're, I mean, I suppose you could say 
similar things about Whitman, who was best when he was in X. Well, they're, they're worse in the but, sense that they're necessarily less complex. I mean, like yes. I said, if you have a great sonnet uh, and you have a great book length poem, the great book length poem is going to be a greater work of art. There's just no getting around that. Uh, Sopping Royal Woods on Snowy Evening uh, is, you know, a 12 line poem, but I don't think you can compare it to uh, something like my grandma Chin poem uh, in terms or a song of, that. of myself or the bridge. Yeah. It's a, it's an impossible comparison. It, it will complex with length as long as the poetry remains great. Yeah. But that, that is a, a great compliment when you can say about a poet that the shortest ones are the worst, as opposed to the inverse of that with most poets where you're saying that this needs to be lobbed off where you should stick to sonnets or you should stick to haikus and, and stay away from the longer ones which are excessive and and full of cliches and and no metaphor no music nothing that you can retain in a smaller form yeah it's like this it's the challenge that i face with this current spy book i'm doing like i said it's going to be a long book it's going to be probably close to 300,000 words or probably, would probably be about 1,000 published words so this is by any any uh measure a, a long book, but it'll probably be about half, excuse me, half the length of the Vincetti brothers and maybe uh, one eighth the length of my other book, A Norwegian in the Family. So, you know, th there's the problem that if you want to talk about like that stupid Bloomian uh, uh, anxiety, the uh, anxiety of influence, uh, I, I have a great anxiety, although I don't really have an anxiety, but uh, not towards any other writers, but towards myself. You're a failure. Well, yeah, and, a, and I think I've mentioned this before that, you know, fear of failure is good because that impels me to, to go on and, 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 and to conquer it. Um, you know, I do that in life. This is one of the things, whether in someone's personal life or in someone's artistic life, is keep moving. And that doesn't mean that if you're hitting a wall that you should just keep doing the same thing. But don't don't give up on uh, on life. Don't give up on uh, art or whatnot. You may you may have run out of gas as an artist, but that doesn't mean that someone can't uh, can't be uh, effective in the arts. Let's say if you were a great writer, Peter, and at the age of sixty you just totally lost it. Let's say you're twenty five now. Let's say by the age of thirty or thirty five you became a great writer, and so you have twenty you have a twenty five or thirty year window that you write. Let's say uh, you're probably not going to be as speedy as me, but let's say you wrote. In 30 years, uh, 50 great poems, 100 great poems, and you wrote, you know, uh, a couple of good short, a great short story manuscripts, and maybe five or six great novels. And then you find out when you're 62, you're like, oh, fuck, I don't have it anymore. Well, that doesn't mean that you can't be as an elder statesman going around talking about your work saying, you know, uh, uh, instead, of, instead of just spending all the time wasting the time, and only you could determine that internally, instead of spending exactly. all your time. But that, that's the thing about that, and I find it uh, very frustrating reading great poets like Jeffers or Walt Whitman, is they have some value still because of the great work they did before. Now, no, no matter what your heights are, it's not going to be all cherries when you descend to such lows if you lose it at 60 or 70 or 80. That's just a... a, a black mark on, on your career um, and you could do so much you're still obviously wise and you're still um, all encompassing to what your work was before but just give it up don't don't uh, don't leave a black mark upon your career with all this excess and crap and hollow imitations of your greatest works yeah. Woody Allen Obviously, in film is a great example of that, as is Martin Scorsese, as is Werner Herzog, and now it's yeah. Terrence Malick, yeah. where they're putting out these uh, seemingly more and more pointless works that are either hollow imitations, in Alan's case, or severe comedowns from what the, the, what the heights that they had before was in Werner Herzog's case. Yeah, I would. There was someone, uh, someone recently. Oh, it might have. Oh, it was that fellow uh, on the IMDb board, I told you, that had forwarded around this bullshit quote about, uh, you know, childhood. C.S. Lewis? Yeah, the C.S. Lewis quote. And, you know, the, the, there's this myth that that creativity springs from childlike wonder. Well, how the fuck many great poems or great books were written by six-year-olds? None. Because that's a, a total myth. The idea that people somehow get stale with age is true uh, when you get 
from middle age to old age, or sometimes from your prime to middle age. But it's absolutely not true. People are at their creative heights in their 20s and 30s, whether they're writing a rock song or whether they're uh, do doing painting. And sometimes in some areas and, and with some artists, it might be a little bit later. I mean, I didn't there's, become a... There's a young man on the E-list named Thomas Evans, who is 20 years old. He's becoming 21. And he has potential to be a great writer. His play and his novella are some of the most mature writing I've ever read from someone that young. But at the same time, it's not Moby Dick. He's not writing something that is so mature and so beyond a, a 20 year old. And this is something that writing does that no other art form has is that it ta it's an adult medium. You find great painters at young ages. You find great musicians at young ages, but no prodigious writer has ever come about where they're writing Moby Dicks yeah. in the same way that you're matching great paintings to Picasso and Matisse. Yeah, and 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 most of those uh, visual prodigies are not uh, are not doing well, anything. Well, I'm not talking about the yeah. frauds. I'm talking yeah. about the real deal kids. Yeah, who at least have potential at the beginning. Now, even someone like Tom, uh, he does have potential, and I think you know Jessica was, and I were talking about this. Like, for example, I think uh, of the people on the E list. For example, Alex uh, uh, has the potential. I think that he could do great poetry. Uh, I think he, he has potential to maybe write a great novel, but I think that's a few years away. I think right now, I, th I think he, he probably could be a really great cultural critic because I think like yes. when, he, when, he, when he writes about politics and whatnot, there's no voice. I mean, there's an old fellow, Len Holman, who before you got, uh, encountered me. Well, I've read him. Yeah. It's hilarious. So, so Len Holman has his own unique kind of thing, but Alex has a more inside he, he digs into things uh with uh historical background and, and whatnot that's very good so i think i think that while he his fictive side has the potential to be great i think right now he could do that greatly tom for example writes uh much uh uh i i told him uh he needs to learn to differentiate his characters and his plays a little bit better one of the things i think i mentioned the last time was uh how you you need to be able to go from character to character without saying Bill said, Joe said, Bob said, Tony said. Um, uh, not not you don't have to go five pages without that differentiation because even then it could get confusing. But you don't have to have it at every one or every third one, maybe every fifth or sixth time a character speaks. But um, so that that's one of the things he has to work on. But well, in the novella, he fixes some of the flaws that were apparent in the play. Yeah. Um, so. It, he is growing already at, at 20 years old, which it, it's, uh, I mean, if I, I had a 20 year old who had that play and I was running a theater, it would be in production immediately yeah. because you have real potential with that kid. 